to the four limitless contemplation. When you get it on, Fee. Can you hear me, Mel? Yeah. I, I've switched the, the slides. I have actually changed the slides, so I'm not sure why it's not changing. Now it's on. It's perfect. Okay. okay. May all beings have happiness and create the causes of happiness. May they all be free from suffering and creating the causes of suffering. May they find that noble happiness, which can never be tainted by suffering. May they attain universal impartial compassion, free of worldly bias towards friends and enemies. Yeah. Dungal dan dungal chichu tang dra wa ju chik dunga me pe de wa tam patang min dra wa ju chik ne ring chak tang ni tang dra we tang nung chim po la ni pa ju chik. So good evening for those I haven't seen yet. And um, tonight we are going to do our lives are temporary dramas on the stage of emptiness. So I'm carrying on with what we were doing before. I just decided to give it another title tonight. And I think that I think it's a lovely title because I think when I look at the world, I mean, there's hardly any good news in the world. But then what's good news? We don't even know what's good news and what's bad news because maybe what looks like bad news might be ultimately good news. We don't even know that. I hope that my computer lasts because my plug is not charging tonight for some reason or another. But anyway, um, we really are carrying on a temporary drama on the stage of emptiness. Now, when you look at a, a theater, the stage... The stage has definitely got props and it's definitely set up for the theater, but it's emptiness still means full of possibility in your stage. And we're going to look at that when we look at the doors of liberation tonight, which is really important. But I want to start with a little story on a man found an eagle's egg and put it in the nest of a backyard hen. I have to say it here, but even if I've told this story before. The eaglet hatched with a brood of chicks and grew up with them. All his life, the eagle did what the backyard chickens did, thinking he was a backyard chicken. He scratched the earth for worms and insects. He clucked and cackled, and he would thrash his wings and fly a few feet into the air and then land. Years passed and the eagle grew very old. One day he saw a magnificent bird far above him in the cloudless sky. It, it glided in graceful majesty among the powerful wind currents with scarcely a beat of its strong golden wings. The old wee eagle looked up in awe. Who's that? He asked. That's the eagle, the king of the birds, said his neighbor. He belongs to the sky. We belong to the earth. We're chickens. So the eagle lived and died a chicken, for that's what he thought he was. Okay. And we better be careful not to be so chicken in whatever role we decide that we're playing. And can I have that, can I have that uh, small society thing as well, please, Fee, if you can. So <clears throat> looking at his identity. Poor old, um, whatever his name is, I can't think of it right now. Um, but he says, kids, I'll never understand them. My son's in California searching for his identity. He says he doesn't know who he is. He's, he carries a driver's license, a social security card, a draft registration card, a voter registration card, an auto insurance card, and an assortment of credit cards. Who boy wants to know who he is? Let him look in his wallet. Now, you know, Akon Rinpoche always says that it's very interesting because he says 
you know, when we're born, we get a birth certificate. And when we die, we get a death certificate, okay? And that's who we are. And sometimes we haven't even died. And they issue a death certificate by mistake. And that means, according to the books, we did. Okay, even if we're not dead, you can't go and explain to them, but I'm not dead. Here I am. When you die, you die, and that's it. You know, you finished. And and uh, if 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 my, our records say that you did, then you did. Okay, it's pitiful when we actually think that the identities of this life are who we are really. And when we arrive, when we arrive at the portal of death and our full identities of this life dissolve, then who is left? And for many, the new identity can be missed of fear because when I dream of people that have just died, when I dream of them, often those people who don't know they've died and who can't understand why nobody can see them. And I've had lots of sleep state experiences when I've had somebody saying to me, but they can't hear me and they can't see me and they're frantic because they've left that identity behind and they're not yet ready to leave it behind. And I've had to explain to them in the sleep state, I often had, used to have these dreams where you can't anymore, they can't see you because you're on another dimension because you've died. And I've even had one guy who said, but I haven't, but I haven't. And I said, yes, you have. And people, when they die, are totally unprepared for, for that. And what happens is, in the bardos, it's a very interesting thing. Because in the bardo of becoming, which is the last bardo, every seven days, you actually have a re repetition of your death. And then... They say you're in the bardos for 49 days, but days could be any amount of time. We don't really know. People might take much longer. But what is written in the Tibetan teachings on death is that about halfway into the bar, the bardo of becoming, suddenly that identity really starts to fade. It actually fades at your death, but you don't realize it. And then when you're halfway, that identity starts to fade. And then you're looking for your new identity. You're looking into an incarnation to see where am I going? And some people are in a frantic hurry to get into a new identity. Big mistake, because it would be much better to look for something that, remain, that we can remain as the core of who we are and then can express itself in myriad ways. I mean, of temporary identities, but when we have a core. So it's a very, very sad thing because if we come into the incarnation with no control, just our karmic imprints catapulting us in, then we really have got a problem because that's why we have this repetitious life where we have the same kind of thing catching up with us all over. So Now's the time to do this and to realize you're not looking for a new identity halfway in the border of becoming. You already found that identity so that when this one dissolves, you're actually able to embrace the new identity and not look for a, some kind of, you know, samsaric identity when you come in. And I just want to give you these few quotes. You can butt in because it's not a big group tonight. So you can really butt in whatever you want to say. But I just want to give you these quotations. One comes from the Tantra of the Heap of Jewels. And this is what it says. Perception. Perception. When it comes from your core, I mean, not from Melanie, but from the essence of who I am, is devoid of expectation and disappointment. Now think of those two words. Most of our lives are just waiting, expecting, and disappointment. Most of our lives are based around expectation and disappointment. And when those things don't actually materialize, we are very, very cut up and we get into a depression. 
and when when we don't get what we expect and then there is this large amount of disappointment now those two words leave you once you once you get to your buddha essence your awakened essence those two words have gone and the other thing jigma limpa says in the yeshi lama is this he says when people with deviant view their mind controlled by externals, everything around them, see the door of irrefutable truth, their entire fixated mountain of belief collapses. So in other words, when we even get an inkling of the truth of who we really are, everything that we fixated on starts collapsing. And it does it in this life. And I can really, really relate to that a lot. Because the things I really used to think about a lot or fixate upon a lot, I still have some of those things, but I can look at them in one second and withdraw my mind away from them. Because everything that you always <laughs> believed in starts collapsing. And then the general things that people do in their lives you're not really interested in doing anymore. It's a very interesting thing. And this other quote, which Jig Malimpa gives, which I found such an interesting quote, he says, a renowned Bodhisattva in his final existence, treasured in the theater of both comedy and tragedy. Isn't that an interesting quote? A renowned Bodhisattva in his final existence, treasured in the theater, we're talking about theater tonight, of both comedy and tragedy. So it's kind of ha ha, you know, look at you. I mean, when I when I was on retreat and I was doing those acting out in all the seven real the six realms of samsara i mean i could actually i could actually laugh afterwards when i was doing the hungry ghost realm and i was picking up everything in the room you've got to act it out absolutely aloud you know and i was picking up everything in the room and suddenly i you know to crave it and attach myself to it and everything you have to exaggerate and i pervalize and make the sounds of hungry ghosts and the sounds of the hell realms and the sounds of everything and actually i thought if anybody could see me they'd definitely think i was crazy and they would definitely laugh. He's laughing because he thinks I'm crazy anyway, but never mind. He, he doesn't have to think. But um, but the thing is that the, the theater of both comedy and tragedy, the laughing fact of acting that all out is quite funny, but it's also tragic, you know, when you really look at it. And look at this war. I mean, I mean, it's it's just it's just the theater of tragedy, but in a way, it's quite hilarious to think that it's been repeated so many times. I mean, you know, it's it's crazy, it's crazy. So he says in the theater of both comedy and tragedy. And this last week. Everything that happens in my life, it's very interesting because when you live in the mandala of Guru Rinpoche, you, you can't help seeing things very, very clearly, very often of how things are actually planted in front of you. And I always have themes in my life. I'm coming to you now, Rigori, and the themes, they usually come in my teaching, in my dreaming, in my counseling, in my daily life, I have these themes that come up again and again. It's very strange because I find that all the people I'm seeing have got a common theme. So this last week, it's been people who just feel so awful about themselves, about their lives, about their, about all sorts of things in their lives, okay, they lack confidence and their childhood issues seem to be 
really haunting them a lot at the moment and making them believe. And they feel, I've had so many people saying to me, I feel as though my life has been such a mess without the prospect of much improvement. That's a very interesting thing because if you hang on to your temporary identity, it can really feel like that. And if you see that you're in the right place at the right time so that you are learning the right lesson, it can change. Rugari, please. So yeah, Ma, as you're talking about the, the comedy, um, I just had a thought of like how, because I know Zon Sarkiense is always talking about this, that we are control freaks, which is, you know, a lot of the reason why we're in samsara. But it's, you know, for all the effort and energy we put into controlling, everything is a mess, you know, as in that's what it then like plays out as. So in this, I guess my um my desire, at least when I practice, is to be able to really, really let go. Because like you're talking about the bardos, everything is going to dissolve. So I'm going to let it go anyway. But um, I guess I wonder about how to, um, you know, there's sort of like these, when you have relationships, because we're still on the relative plane, almost like who to turn away or like turn away from because it's not like helpful for path versus like me turning away because it's aversion. It's so interesting what you say. So interesting because, you know, I know in the teaching, it says that you should actually make your path, Halavaron, it, it should you know I me, mean? you should actually make your path with like minded people. But then what about what about all the karma that we've got with people, you know, with people that are not like minded? I mean, we've got a lot of karma with people that are not like minded. But, you know, the whole thing is, to me, I think it's just about impossible to actually take ourselves and make ourselves, unless you're a nun or a monk and you're living in a monastery and you're doing something like that, you absolutely, you know, in, in when you're living in samsara, it's almost impossible to put yourself only with like-minded people, like where you are. You're going to have to, shame she keeps get bumping off. Well, you're going to have to make your life with other people, with intellectual people and people, you know, that you may not have a lot in common with. And you have to do that. But, you know, I always look at it like this, with the people that you have to associate with that are not like-minded in any way, okay, with those kind of people, I think it's really important that you give whatever service that you have and that you keep yourself based in your own essence all the time, even though you're kind of participating, you know, in, in whatever they are doing at the time. But, you know, for you, I can really understand how difficult that is because when you're at university, you are – you you largely with a lot of intellectual people who use mainly their human minds and don't use the rest of the part of their minds and everything. And it's really, really difficult. However, however, as long as you get up in the morning and you do some practice and you keep yourself rooted in your own awakened nature. I think you can throw some enlightenment to people in those kind of situation. And I think when you're in a class at university, I would have loved to know what I know now. I would have opened my mouth like nobody's business, you know. I would have disagreed with so many things and all of that kind of thing. I really would have. But the thing is that, that I think that it's very difficult. And somebody was saying to me this week, you know, I've got these two guys, the one I'm much more attracted to, and he's not on the pathway. The other one, I'm attracted like to his mind, and he really is on the pathway, but I'm not that physically attracted to him. What do I do? You know, and I said, that's a very difficult question for me to answer. Okay, I can only tell you from old age, 
that it would be better if you chose the one that was like-minded for you to go along the pathway. But I really can understand that if you're looking at a life and you're not that attracted to the one who's like-minded like you, it could be a little bit of a problem, you know. You'd have to grow to love them and that kind of thing if you're in a relationship. So I think it's a very difficult thing. But I do know that if you are on a deep spiritual path, it would be better to find a partner who was like-minded. But karma doesn't always allow us to do that, okay? So the thing is that, that if it doesn't, we've got to try and be centered in what we are and carry on. But certainly if one's choosing, if one's at that point of your life where you're choosing, for me, I've got to give my my advice, you know, how I feel about it, but it's not me that has to get into bed with the guy, you know, so, <laughs> I mean, you've got to have a physical attraction, and there might be a karmic attraction with that person, you know, so it's, a, it's very difficult, you know, it really, really is, but I think you have to just, you have to keep it, you're on a stage, you're acting out the roles, you have to keep them, and there's nothing else you can do. But you have to keep going on your journey, because if you don't, and you let it go, even for one minute, you really are not, you're really going to let it go, and go into the samsaric identity. So it's really important to me. But I think, if you are on a spiritual path, if you're on a really intense spiritual path, and Diana, I want to say to you that like, you know, it's so, you've got to understand when we were doing Guru Rinpoche, that he said in that prayer, that um, when you are, when you are going on a spiritual pathway, it's so easy for obstacles to come into your pathway. Because that's what Guru Rinpoche said the Rakshasas do. Not only do they do terrible things like the terrorists did, but they also interfere with your pathway. Now, tonight it's very interesting because I had about 10 messages from people. This happened or that happened or they were sick or they didn't have, they didn't have, uh, they had load shedding or this or that or the other. You know, these things we don't realize, they trap us from going there. They're always going to be there are always going to be obstacles, especially when you're quite far on your spiritual path. And if you're on a Buddhist path, okay, with this future of the age of degeneration, the clearing of our negative imprints can accelerate. Now, I want you to know that, that during this time, when you have very negative things facing you, it might be a real blessing in disguise because your spiritual, your clearing of your negative imprints can accelerate so that you're given a chance to see the light, okay? And if we can manage to see that all the bitter lessons were just an opportunity, a self-created opportunity to let go of the transitory negative identity and move into that essence and what I was talking about, the identitylessness, which is full of possibility, which means if we see the painful lessons as a temporary, transitory, a chance for a renewed life, then what happens is spontaneously, new possibilities manifest and they won't if you don't trust your core nature because so many people let me just say this when we are low and in a negative place as long as we allow the truth of the circumstances to play out without resisting them they will pass and new opportunities will arise spontaneously now, you know, so many people have said to me, what can I do? I'm really in a negative place. And I'm really sorry that a whole lot of those people are not here tonight. And I hope they'll listen to this. Because 
when you're in that situation, when you're there, okay, if you allow that, you don't resist it, you, you let it play out, even with a certain gratitude about it, then the new opportunities spontaneously present themselves to you. But these new opportunities may not be as our egos would have chosen them. You may land up in a situation you would not have chosen yet. It's perfect for your spiritual growth. And strangely, for your giving service, you didn't even know when you got trapped there. And we could not have planned that with the conditioned part of the mind. It's so, so interesting because over all the years, I've always counseled so many people that went through tragedy. And a lot of them years later say to me, I could not have conceived that what happened to me would have led me to be doing what I'm doing. You see, the new opportunities are spontaneous. They come from a different source to your ego and your own particular self. They come from a different source. So they just arise when you submit and you don't resist. It's really very, very important that we actually have to know that whatever is in front of us comes from a mirror of our minds. It comes out of our minds, all the things that we are doing, out of our imprints, out of what we have. And collectively, it also comes out. That's why when people send me all these videos of the war and it's people chanting, free these people, free those people. I go mad, I just switch off the video. I don't want to hear. That's that collective negative imprint. It's much better to ponder very, very carefully and see what is being played out here. What is this all about? What needs to happen? Who's not learning the lessons? Why is this lesson repeating itself in so many ways? Now, I just want to read you a story, then I'll throw it open for discussion. The story is told of a king in Africa who had a close friend with whom he grew up. The friend had a habit of looking at every situation that ever occurred in his life, positive or negative, and remarking, this is good. Okay. One day, the king and his friend were out on a hunting expedition. The friend would load and prepare the guns for the king. The king had apparently done something wrong. The friend had done something wrong in preparing one of the guns. For after taking the gun from his friend, the king fired it and his thumb was blown off. Okay. Examining the situation, the friend remarked, as usual, this is good. To which the king replied, no, this is not good. And proceeded to send his friend to jail after his finger was blown off. About a year later, the king was hunting in an area that he should have known that he shouldn't have been in. He should have stayed clear of. Cannibals captured him and took them to his village. They tied his hands, stacked some wood, set up a stake and bound him to the stake. As they came near to set fire to the wood, they noticed that the king was missing a thumb. Being superstitious, they never ate anyone that was less than whole. So untying the king, they sent him on his way. As he returned home, he was reminded of the event that has taken his thumb, and he felt remorse for the treatment of his friend. He went immediately to jail to speak with his friend. You were right, he said. It was good that my thumb was blown off. And he proceeded to tell the friend all that had just happened. And so I'm very sorry for sending you to jail for so long. It was bad for me to do this. No, his friend replied, this is good. What do you mean, said the king, this is good. How could it be good that I send my friend to, to jail for a year when my blown off thumb kept me alive? He says, if I had not been in jail, 
I would have been with you. <laughs> so I would have been eaten by the cannibals. <laughs> So I think it's such a lovely story because do we know what's good and what's bad? Do we know why things happen? Can we see? Can we balance? Can we actually understand that all these things are really, really very different to what we actually what we actually doing and actually believe in? Now I'm throwing it open. Maybe you want to say something. What was that? Anyone. Because it's very interesting when you look at it. But how many people, and right now, I've just got to look at my phone to see how many people are in a negative state. And I wonder why when people are in a negative state, they actually always will excuse themselves from a spiritual gathering. But they'll go to work or they'll do all those things, but they won't come to a spiritual gathering. Interesting. Anyone? Oh, oh, yes, please. Um, just thinking about your, at the beginning, you were talking about um, life is, is comedy on the stage of, of tragedy and comedy. And I'm always reminded in, in those sort of examples that, that, everything has its other side you know you you can't just have light because you need the darkness to show the light and the light to show the darkness okay. and to show the tragedy and the comedy and and i think it 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 rounds you as a, as a person in this experience to 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 go through both because then you don't, you don't take things for granted yeah it's absolutely true but let me ask you Mm. Is it necessary? Is it really necessary? Could we not see the light unless we've seen the darkness? Isn't that a samsaric statement? Mm. I think it is necessary because if, if you look at, I don't know, how, how things are created, um, if you create a beautiful piece of metalwork, if it's silver or copper, brass it doesn't matter you hammer it which is a sort of a violent action but out of that comes a beautiful object so there's, there's always both sides to it and I, I i really believe that you my my personal feeling is you have to have both now i, I think there is both and i think you're right but i think you have to really be careful with it because mm -hmm. we we always say someone's got to go through a death and a bereavement and then they come out or then they get on a path or then they do that. And you're absolutely right. But, you know, the whole thing is I, I, I think that you could, like in pure lands, you could live in the light. You know, you could live in the light without having darkness and know that you are in the light. But unfortunately in samsara, we need the darkness to remind us that there is also light. Mm -hmm. So you're absolutely right in that regard. And people don't understand it unless they really have go through dark experiences, you know. Mm -hmm. So, no, you're 100% right, but you're also 100% not right because basically <laughs> that's what we've made ourselves to. We have to have a dark, we have to have a dark occasion to bring us back to the light. But do you need a dark experience as you're going through, when you're in the light? Do you need darkness? Do you, some, uh, do you, do you have to experience the darkness? That, that's the other question, you know, to be aware of it, but you don't necessarily, you know, if you put your hand in the fire, you're going to get burnt. Yeah. But if you know that the fire will burn you, you're careful. So no, I don't think you necessarily no. have to have to go no. through all the bad experiences. Yes, but how many people in this life, you know, when I just listen to all the opinions about the war, you know, no, very few people really think deeply about this war. They really, very few people do. They just side with something. They side with either or with their collective consciousness and they fight on that basis and everything and nobody looks deeply. You know that I often switch on the television 
And then if there's somebody talking for the other side, I like to listen to it, even in politics and that. I like to hear what the other person is saying because it's interesting because you put the question mark there. I think I think maybe we do have to have dark to go through it, but maybe we maybe once we reach that real high spot, we don't have to have it anymore. I don't know. You know, in samsara you need darkness because nobody can see the light. It's very, very sad. You know, there are too many people that can't see the light. And then they get these dark experiences and that's it. You're not. Yeah, I, I wonder, um, I mean, two things. The one is the, the, the other story, the last story you, you, you just read about um, the, good. The, king, the king and the friend. So it, it appears, at least to me, that the, the friend doesn't even see anything dark. So because it's whatever happens is good. So, uh, and I mean the 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 other side. I don't know because I haven't experienced it. But I I would I would definitely think that um, I mean whatever I heard from you or read or whatever that an enlightened being. Uh, I mean, at at the end of the day, dark and light is dualistic, isn't it? And bad and good is dualistic. So I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm really. This is an intellectual exercise I'm doing here because I've got no experience of it, and that's why I also would. I, I always I was a strong follower of this. What D Diana just said. So well, everything has got the other side. But I start thinking that maybe, yeah, just because we haven't had an experience of a oneness of not like one is the opposite of the other that doesn't mean that it doesn't exist exactly but the thing the thing is so interesting here because when he said this is good okay it wasn't that he thought that the act itself was good he just thought that the good could come out of whatever negative experience there was it's a bit of a difference in thinking the negative is good it's really thinking, well, a different experience could come out of out of the negative thing. And I think when we've got that, yeah, Mim, please. Yeah, I just want to say literally in yeah, in our country, the dark, let's take it very literally. Okay. We have the dark to appreciate the light. I think we really have, just in terms of being practical. I think you've, we've got to reach a stage where it won't matter. But at this point, I think we are all very, very aware of the light after having experienced the dark. It's made us appreciate the light. Yeah. We're not that, at that where we kind of light, dark, doesn't, doesn't matter. It's all the same. You see, it is the same. And to the lamas, it's the it's same. True. When they have an enlightened mind, it's actually the same. They don't mind at all going through negative things. I mind, but they yeah. don't. And I'm and saying so, it's interesting that yeah. it's so difficult here. Yeah, and we've got to jump over the ocean and come to the other side. And don't think we can't, Mark, because we can. We can jump over the ocean. We can see things from a different perspective. We really, really can. It's really possible to do that. And I think it's I think it's really probable that all of us could reach that. And I think it's I think that the word emptiness is one of the things that really gives us the possibility of being able to go beyond light and dark, which I'm going to talk about. But it's really very, very important because when you understand a different perspective, you see things from a completely different point of view. But even on a on a relative level, on a samsaric level, if you if you could see that whatever darkness you're going through ultimately is light and ultimately is going to give you the ability to see the light, then I think it's okay. I really, really do. And I want us to look at now on James Lowe. He gave this talk on emptiness, equanimity, and kindness, okay? And he said, 
You've got to know emptiness because if you don't know emptiness, and I've got a really good teaching, I may not give it to you tonight, I may give it to you next time, but I've got a really good teaching on emptiness. And he says, if you don't have emptiness and understanding, then although you have a good heart and you have kindness and are a responsibility for others, you won't be able to go deep and you won't have a basis for transforming your own appreciation of the world. Actions will be based on duality and ignorance. So as soon as it's duality, if I come to you and I want to do something for you because you're in a bad way, then it's done with duality. It's done, here is me, the good person giving service to poor you. But in the meantime, poor you is me, and poor me is you. The giver, there actually isn't a giver and a giving. There's actually no one doing it. It's ignorance. And so what you're doing becomes easily dispersed because you can't keep it up. You can't, the duality makes us absolutely change. Now, when someone went to the Buddha after he taught for 80 years, okay, and said, how did you manage to teach for 80 years? Where did you get the energy? I don't know where you got the energy. He said like this. He said, there was no sense of I teaching. There was only spontaneous activity through me. Now, all of you, Tell me how you get spontaneous activity through you, Fiona. How do you get spontaneous activity through you? It's my theme. Okay. If you just accept where you are, then the spontaneous activity comes up. Yeah, I mean, if I, I, so you want me to answer, make, have, think about it. Yeah, I, I think that the, rea the reality is you, you've got to just simply try and be within the moment and not it's, it's that that not judging things as good or bad you know that that projection that we always have um but i think it's more about being i think compassion comes into it as well if you you have that limitless compassion for for people as well that, that means you're not focused on yourself you're, you're focused on on the environment around you the the, the beings around you you, you know if you, i think the compassion is also quite a, a strong component of this but I mean, what I was always, always the message I always seem to get when I watch these masters um, in a different teachings is literally, it's it's about being. It's not so much about doing or perceiving or I, I don't know how to put it into words. But you you need to be the wisdom, be the compassion, yeah. and yeah. you know get rid of all the, the. That's why they want you to get rid of all those obscurations because then you 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 actually. You're no longer you. You are that wisdom and compassion in union, literally. That's that's how I see it, but I could be wrong. No, I think you are 100% right. And I think it's being, not doing. I think that's your emphasis that you're talking about, being and not doing. Because once you understand, all you have to do is be there, present, in this moment. And then it starts happening through you. I can't explain it to you. But the ego keeps on interfering because it wants to know what are we going to do? How are we going to get this? Which, what's our plan? What should we do? But if we did nothing, like I watch Lama Yeshi, he'll do things he needs to do. He'll set them in motion. But he never worries about what's next the next day and the next day and the plans. and the, He doesn't do that. And the thing is, okay, he's lucky because he's got people to do it for him. But how do we get to that point where we just allow things to be? Very difficult. Very, very difficult. Okay. But when we are connected to our essence, connected, say, to the mandala of Guru Rinpoche, then the things start arising spontaneously. What's the difference? Vian, please go for it. This is so good. Yeah. 
Yeah, maybe just talking a little bit uh, of my own experience, but what I could imagine for like maybe someone you're talking about like Lama Yesha is just like um, you can imagine like a deep intrinsic knowing of that of that being, you know, and like a trust in those characters. So we're talking about this compassion and and the being and like for, like I relate what what Martin was also saying. Sometimes it feels like I'm intellectually talking about these things that I hear and that I read, and sometimes I have little glimpses of it and then you know day-to-day -day life sometimes you catch myself i'm like whoa like five hours just went by and it was just like you know this narrative but at least i'm thankful that i that i managed to see it a couple of times in the day you know um but yeah just to, to be in that place where you are in that 100 and like just know that that it's there and it's fully present and but uh, i'm not there uh, well ultimately yes you know but um I'd assume that those masters are there the whole time. That's why there's no that this that that sense of self seems like such it's like a joke. It's like what ego? Oh, come on, that's a joke, you know. Um, if you if you have that, if you, can, if you can see and know what the truth is, really, right? Yeah. No, honestly, I think you're so right. But the thing is that I think that these teachings, you know, I've been listening to Zong Sa's Abhi Dharma teachings. I can't stand those teachings. I know that they're absolutely brilliant. And someone sent me, I've got to bring it to you. I don't know how I'm going to show it. Fiona will find a way. But this guy brought me this chart, okay, as big as I don't know what, and I don't know where I'm going to put it, but he brought me this chart with the wheel and everything the way we are, all the particular forms that we are, you know, every, the skandhas, everything is on this chart. I mean, it is mind boggling. Everybody should have this chart, you know, to see how we function, what we are and all the rest of it. But you know what? This is so simple what we're talking about because you just have to be in the place, accepting it. And then suddenly the next event arises. I know it. I know it with my being. Sometimes when I'm going through, oh, such a horrible time and nothing seems to be working out and I'm really battling with everything. And suddenly I just let go. I just think, oh, well, too bad. And I come and sit in my shrine room. And suddenly it arises where the next point is, what has to happen or I get a phone call, or I get something, and there is what I have to do at that particular time. But we don't have the confidence in that. We don't have the confidence to trust that if we aren't conniving, we'll be, it'll be, a, you know, it won't work. So what I want to say is, listen, I think a lot of you are tired. I want to, what I want to do, just let me tell you what I want to do. And I'm happy to do it next time if you are tired. But you know what? Um, I wanted to do what conditioned existence looks like. All the marks, the three marks of conditioned existence. And then go into the skandhas and see how practically the skandhas work with us. The five skandhas, form, feelings, perceptions, habits, and consciousness. I want to do that. And then I wanted to do a meditation on how the skandhas actually operate within us. Because when you can understand this, you can come to a spontaneous point. But just tell me whether you'd rather, you'd rather not do it tonight. Would you like to do it? Because a few of you really look very, very tired tonight. I think next time for me, please, Mel. Yeah, I can see that you really are very, very tired. Now, I'm happy because I think that this is very important. We can do a meditation and we can end early tonight, but I really want to do this. I've got lovely material on how the three marks of conditioned existence, suffering, impermanence, and the absence of an inherent self-nature, those are the three marks. Remember those three marks. Suffering, impermanence, and the absence of a self-nature. Those are the three of an inherent self-nature. Those are the three marks 
of our conditioned existence. And we live according to those. And the point is, we forget about them. We think there's an inherent self nature. We think there's a, we, we, we think things are permanent and we think we can get away without suffering. And we can't. Those are the features that we're living with at the moment. So let's do a little meditation anyway. And um, just breathe in and breathe out. And just come to this moment. A very, very precious moment. Because just remember, when you get that aha, when you get that, oh, I know, you can't get it through intellect. You can't get it in any other way other than deep, deep, deep inside you. And we are learning to try and have confidence in that awakened essence inside of us. And I think if we look at the first two marks of suffering of conditioned existence, suffering, I think that the Buddha taught about nothing except suffering. And what is suffering? Suffering is when we have the negative imprints and they play out and the ego is left behind, and we feel real pain and suffering. And that's the whole of our lives. Can we breathe in and just let go of all the things that are happening to us? The pain, the outcomes, the connivings, the workings out, the plannings, can we just completely let them go and let us be in this very present moment? We're going to look at the skandhas. We're going to really examine them and see how we can find that lack of an inherent self-nature and stop feeding a self that doesn't really exist. So breathe in and breathe out and just let everything come up all the things we're struggling with work sickness pain absolutely everything let it all arise in front of you Just stare at it, look at it, look into it. Let it arise and let it dissolve. the great stage of emptiness. Emptiness means full of possibility. Put your tools down, put your weapons down. And just let everything be just as it is in this moment. Don't pick it up, don't grasp, don't analyze. Just let it all be.
if you don't take anything out of tonight, just take out that spontaneous activity. As soon as you're able to let go and let be, spontaneous activity can arise. And what I want to do with you is I want to do, um, I want to do, first of all, the three marks of conditioned existence. Second of all, how the five skandhas appear in our lives and how we can change our attitudes to each of the skandhas, which James Lowe really tackles in a beautiful way. And thirdly, I want to do the three doors to liberation, how you actually go through the doors of liberation. But you know what? I'm happy if everybody's tired to end. I can just see that the whole the whole mood of tonight with all the people that are sick with this or that or the other, maybe we just call it a day tonight and we carry on. And when you're fresh next time, come fresh. Let's start to do the whole thing. I think it's really pointless to try and do it when I can see so many people are tired. So I'll stay to um, answer any questions that anybody wants. And um, let's dedicate for you. And let's dedicate to everyone in the war and the war in U Ukraine, which seems to have been forgotten about. We really dedicate to all the Palestinians who are being uprooted, to the Israelis who are waiting for their hostages, to all those in Ukraine who are really suffering badly, to the people in the earthquakes in Afghanistan, to all beings who are suffering, we dedicate these teachings. And through this merit, may we achieve all seeing Buddhahood and thereafter, once all harmful enemies have been defeated, may all beings be liberated from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of birth, old age, sickness and death. Sonam die tamche zipane topne nepe dranam tamche ne jega nachi bala propaye sipe sole doa do warsho.